Willis Jenkins, so good to see you. And we just wanted to capture a little bit of this amazing project that you're working on from the University of Virginia, the coastal waters, and particularly how different ways of knowing um, are bringing out something from your colleagues, from you, towards a future that we don't yet know. But give us a feel for this work that you're doing. Right, so yes, yeah, so I'm at the University of Virginia and um, I convene our Environmental Humanities Initiative. And one of the things that we're doing is trying to bring the, the methods, the knowledges, the skills of the arts and the humanities to help convene a space for new kinds of experimental collaborations with the sciences, uh, and especially to be able to address uh, rapid environmental changes. And so one of the things that UVA has an existing research strength in is in uh, coastal research. So we have a, a, an NSF-funded long-term ecological research project that tracks coastal changes on the biggest stretch of undeveloped coastline on the Atlantic coast. Mm. It's a really important laboratory for how coasts are responding to uh, accelerated sea level rise, to global warming, um, to species migrations. Um, it's just uh, critical research. And it's and it has been kind of a little project inside our environmental sciences department um, that, that not many people in the university know about. Uh, and so as I was looking around for places where we could develop some kind of exciting collaboration, I thought, well, maybe we can do something at this research center, which has, um, has been there returning to the same place over and over for decades, really understanding how this system changes, which will be just crucial systems around the planet mm -hmm. for... Um, what happens as the, as the seas rise, as the temperatures change, yeah. so many vulnerable coastal settlements, how will these systems interact? What, yeah. are, their, what are their tipping points? What are, what are their thresholds for different kinds of interactions? What happens to barrier island systems? They're researching all these questions, and so few of us know about it, and so few of our ways of knowing interact with it. Right. Yeah. So you've mentioned NSF, National Science Foundation. Yeah. Big grant. Yeah. Intense research from the sciences. Yeah. So what are you doing to inter face humanities and science here? So we have a project called the Coastal Futures Conservatory. And I have to tell you a story about it. Um, this, will, this will join the Environmental Humanities Observatory Network that Joni Adamson and others have sparked uh, around the world. We'll be one little member site of it. Um, but as I was getting the team together, I, uh, my co-director on this is um, the extraordinary eco-acoustic composer Matthew Bertner. I said, Matthew... Um, we should, we should collaborate together. We should bring the arts and the humanities and the sciences together at this coastal research station, and we should join uh, the observatory network. And he paused and he said, observatory, it's such a visual metaphor. And then we had this extraordinary conversation about visual versus aural modes of knowing. And so um, I was impressed enough by that conversation to think we should center this project around listening entirely. Mm -hmm. And so we're using listening as an organizing practice in concept in a, in a couple different ways. So um, all of our researchers participate in contemplative listening exercises. And at another level, we're um, using field recording and sonified data mm. to create new ways of scientific engagement with publics and also new, and new forms for the sciences to communicate what they're doing and for the public to experience the science of environmental change. Um, so not just to, not to see it in a graph, but to hear sea mm. level rise, right? Mm. Um, and then um, we're exploring listening as a mode of knowing. And of course, we're listening across disciplines. That is such a great phrase, listening as a mode of knowing. So give us an example. You've told us a little bit, out on the boat, the scientists, the headphones, the mm. reactions. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll t I can tell you something that happened during a... Uh, kind of a, a pilot field trip that we yeah. undertook as a test run for this to see if it, if, if it could be something. Um, uh, I had a little grant and I brought um, the director, um, Karen McGlathery, who's the director of this Coastal Research Center and also the director of UVA's Environmental Resilience Institute. Um, so a, a key lead scientist for a number of initiatives. Um, I brought her and the chair of the Environmental Sciences Department. Um, the chair of the Religious Studies Department came uh, who's a, uh, a well-known um, scholar of Tibetan poetry, an historian of religion, uh, and uh, Matthew Bertner, the, this, um, uh, he's the chair of the music department and eco-acoustic composer. 
And Matthew and I had thought of uh, beginning this with a few uh, intentional listening exercises in which Matthew um, effectively gave everyone just a handheld recorder and some and headphones. And we went to one. We went in a boat out to one of the mud flats where there's a particular uh, kind kind of ongoing research. And we got out of the boat, and Matthew just said, "Okay, now everyone, we're going to start the day by, by you just going off for 30 minutes by yourself. I want you to listen." And so we each went off in our different direction. We picked something or or some place to to listen. And um, and I have to tell you that that entire 30 minutes. Um, was not much of a contemplative experience for me because I was so worried. I thought, here we have this extraordinary historian. We have this uh, this um, field-leading scientist, two field-leading scientists in coastal ecology. And they're going to think that this may be a slight waste of time, that we should have jumped right into our research exchange. We had a seminar scheduled for later in the day. Well, we came back, Karen McGlathery, she, she came back, took off her headphones and said, every single researcher here must do this exercise. And the reason was is because it was a place that she had been researching for decades. And yet, in that 30 minutes, she had an entirely different experience of it. And she realized that um, her powers of perception had been um, broadened and expanded. And it made her um, not only experience the environment in a new way, but it kind of it opened her to the, the conversations we had later that day about roles for literature and for poetry and for history and other ways of, uh, other ways of knowing, other ways of interacting with uh, that site and all the kinds of coastal research that they do there. It's such a great story because, as you've said, to scientists are looking for ways to interact. So just to fill that out a little bit more, what were you listening to exactly? Well, so there, there, were, there were several things we did. And we had that open-ended exercise in which people could just, they could choose whatever. They could um, listen to the uh, grass rustling or... Um, I have to tell you for myself, um, it's an extraordinary exercise. We call them exercises in augmented orality. So you, you hear something, you, you're alive to the vibrations of your environment in a new way. This was a microphone. For me, the most extraordinary thing was to meditate on being a large mammal in this environment because you, every step you just hear <laughs> <laughs> um, But let me tell you, let me tell you about um, some of the other um, designed listening stations that we set up. So this is the next stage. Of um, Still, we're not trying to get data yet of any kind. Mm -hmm. We are doing that. Mm -hmm. But we weren't getting there yet. Um, um, so Matthew uh, had set up uh, in a particular place a, um, a listening station that was connected to a hydrophone that sat above an oyster reef. And at the same time, a microphone that was placed in a, um, an, an oyster shell so it would, it would catch the wind reverberating as it came through it. And so when, you, when all, of, all of us put our headphones on, we heard the sound of the oyster reef. That was very surprising. Um, even the scientists who were, in, were studying oyster reefs there had never heard the sound of, of an oyster reef. It has all these um, snapping shrimp in it, mm. and so they're making this popping sound. And then you could hear the movements of the water moving through it. And then it turned out, on subsequent analysis, that you could hear the actual metabolism of the oyster itself. It makes it kind of a low little rumble, which you wouldn't catch unless someone was pointing it to you. Mm. That's important because of something else I'm going to tell you in a second. Uh -huh. But, um, uh, so when we put the headphones on, um, you immediately hear this underwater vitality, this whole city of life, this multi-species city, which you would not know. It's just from this water just lapping at your feet, and it's opaque, and you can't imagine there's a world there, this whole world. And at the same time, you also hear the, the wind pushing through the carapace of a long-dead organism. Mm. And you hear you know, life and death. And, in, and mm. having received a briefing about what's happening here, about um, the way that the oyster beds are responding to sea level rise and so on, you, uh, suddenly there's, like a, there's this drama mm. that you feel like that you're, you have a, a window of perception into. Beautiful. So, um, so we had a successful field trip. Came back to UVA and I thought, okay, yes, we're going to focus on this site. We're going to use listening as an organizing concept. And, um, and I invited a few researchers to, um, to come to a table and I described what we were doing and asked if they would be in, interested in participating. And one of those was um, an environmental scientist at UVA named Matthew Reidenbach who studies oyster reefs. And um, we played for him the recording of the oyster reef. And... He immediately had this idea, oh, I could use acoustic monitoring of oyster reefs as a possible um, index of some of the uh, signatures. Basically, I can use acoustic monitoring 
to see if there are acoustic indices of oyster reef health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, it turns out he can. Yeah. And we had so we fund so we funded a project over the summer where a, one of his PhD students collaborated with a PhD student from the music department. Mm -hmm. They built their own instrument, um, and they brought it out to this oyster reef. And um, and and you know, from here, um, I may the this, the the um, the confluence of ecology, music theory, and engineering begins to lose me a little bit. But what they basically found out is that um, oyster reefs do in fact respond to their soundscapes. They're not only making sounds, but mm -hmm. they're they're responding to it, and they make different kinds of sounds um, when they are um, uh, basically filtering more water, feeding more, and growing more, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they were able to track um, how they respond to different uh, aspects of, the, of what's going on around the boats and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so, here's, so here's a place. So this is what's, what's great about this, is that that original kind of contemplative, open-ended listening gave rise to questions that expanded the possibility for scientific inquiry in this place, we know more about oyster reefs now because of simply doing that open-ended listening exercise, yeah. right? Amazing. Yeah. I mean, and then the next step from that is that that music student, Eli Stein, extraordinary PhD student in, in um, electronic music, is um, composing musical pieces from the data that they captured from the oyster reef. So now you're give, mm -hmm. you're, it's giving rise to new forms of creative expression. Mm -hmm. And so... It allows audiences the chance to, to interact with the life of um, these oyster reefs. Yeah. The symphony of oysters. Yeah. yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, just to conclude what is obviously an incipient and yet already flourishing project, yeah. um, maybe you can just punctuate it by saying your feeling for the feeling for the organism, but the feeling for this cooperative universe that's emerging mm. between different disciplines. Just give us a, a feel for that. Oh, that's such a great question. <laughs> um, so you, I mean, you sense already that um, there's there's a there's a real resonance among the the, the different researchers who are coming together around this project. Um, new creative possibilities of inquiry and discovery emerging from it. Well, maybe the thing that so I'm an ethicist. Uh, I study I study environmental ethics. I study intersections of religion, nature, and ecology. Um, uh, what am I doing in this? And I have to say that this is unexpected for me. I didn't know this going in, but I've really been, I've been, I've been reading and thinking more about how listening is a kind of ethical relation itself. Um, by listening to this living coast, this changing coast, um, that's the first step in being able to respond to it. Mm -hmm. Just like it is in dialogue. Mm -hmm. And the, the mm -hmm. first step to being able to have a, a response to something is, is to, is to listen. Mm -hmm. To what you're asking and what you're saying, mm -hmm. but there's also more than that. It's not just like it's not just getting information to then make a response. There, we all discovered that in the listening itself, that that is a kind of posture. It's a it's an openness. It's a humility. It's a, um, uh, an engendering, right? Um, and so, listening becomes a kind of relation in itself that we that we at the conservatory might want to more broadly cultivate, if we think about that in kind of metaphoric ways, inviting people into listening relationships with these living environments as a way to, to let those living environments come alive to us and to ask questions of us. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. And this extension of our senses to be in resonance with the world around yeah. us has, I think we would agree, yet unknown but immense potential for living in, rela in deeper relationship yeah. in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Willis. Yeah. This is great. Thanks Thank so much. You. Yeah. Thank you.